Oh. Yay. Okay. So I'm Amber and I know I see a lot of familiar names on here tonight. So hopefully you know you know me. If you don't, my name is Amber Gilsdorf. I've been with Estrella as a college planning consultant. This is my seventh application cycle. So in this biz, we say application cycles and not always years. Um, this is my seventh application cycle with Estrella and my 16th application cycle professionally. I worked for nine years as a school counselor at a public high school in Granville, Ohio. And one of my roles there uh, was managing the college counseling curriculum and every year was responsible for somewhere around 80 seniors and all of their applications and letters of recommendation. So I've got a lot of application cycles under my belt. Jamie, go ahead and introduce yourself. All right. My name is Jamie Kirby and I am with my first application cycle with Estrella um, coming from 15 years of experience as a high school counselor. So I've been through the process um, many times. I was at Bishop Watterson High School in Columbus for nine years. And then before that, I was at Fisher Catholic High School in Lancaster for about six years. Um, and each of those years throughout my career, I've had anywhere from about 40 to 60 seniors, um, as well as freshmen through juniors going through the the process. So we've I've done it start to finish with lots and lots of students throughout the years. So just to go over the agenda for tonight, we're going to start with some insights from last year's admission cycle and talk about just some numbers and some data of what's been happening over the last few years in the admissions world. Um, we'll talk about institutional priorities, and then we're going to get into the secret sauce tips and strategies. And then some reassurance and reality. So we're gonna kind of revisit some of those numbers and look at some additional data. The importance of a balanced list. And then we'll leave about 15 minutes at the end for questions if you have any. Also feel free to type the questions in the Q&A as we go along, as Amber said. So we're gonna start with some insights from last year's admission cycle. So if you're looking at these numbers, just to put some things in context, the first number, that first percentage is from the 2021 application cycle. And then the second one is 21-22. And then the third one that is highlighted is last year. So there's been a continued increase in applications to highly selective colleges, which is driving the acceptance rates down. So those first numbers you'll see, 20% at Northeastern, 20% at Boston University, 32% at Boston College, those are from the 2021 cycle, which is a bit of an anomaly because that was during the pandemic, but most of those students, a lot of those students at least, had already taken test scores. And so you didn't see that entire full impact of test optional on the application numbers that you see in those next two years. So Northeastern has gone from a 20% acceptance rate to 7% to 6%. Boston University, 20% to 14 to 10.7. Boston College, 32 to 28 to 27. And Tufts has gone from 11% to a 9.5% admit rate. So you can see just that general trend is some pretty severe downward numbers. Um, the last four parts are specific to Tufts, but can really be applied across the board to highly selective colleges. There's been a 50% increase in application since the pandemic. And we'll get into some of why that is. Some of it is um, test optional policies. Um, there's a couple other reasons. We'll get into that in a minute. So at Tufts specifically, they had 34,000 applications last year for 1,800 spots. So, and they've had the largest early decision pools ever. And they also had the largest engineering pools yet. So. That the pure numbers of applications to these schools are just increasing hugely. Behind the scenes, colleges really are a business and have some business um, strategies to them. So enrollment management makes selecting a class very difficult. So colleges are trying to hit a number of students that they're accepting, which is their yield. If they, or the students that are attending, I'm sorry, if it's if the number of students that they accept that decide to come are too low, that means lost revenue. If the, if they have too many students decide to come that they accepted, 
then they have not enough housing. So they're trying to find that balance between how many students do we accept and how many will actually come here. They have uh, sophisticated algorithms to predict that. And sometimes you will see something called yield protection, which means a student that you think would probably get in doesn't get in because they think that that student's probably not actually going to attend. So they're trying to find that balance, like I said, of number of students accepted and number who will actually come. They use early decision to lock in a certain percentage of the incoming class because they know those students have to come. So they know that they're guaranteed to have a certain number of students already through that early decision round. And Amber will talk more about early decision strategies later on in the presentation. So I mentioned earlier, there's been that huge increase in applications. And why is that? Couple different reasons. Test optional policies have removed a barrier to applying. So in the past, you know, students who had, you know, great tests or great GPAs and great activities, but lower test scores may have just not even submitted applications. Now with test optional, they've got more options. They're thinking, I'll go ahead and try and apply without my test scores and see what happens. Um, there's also kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy there in that the lower the acceptance rate, the more students want to attend, which then drives more applications, which then lowers the acceptance rate. It's like a cycle that you can't get out of. And then also a fixation on colleges that are at the top of the ranking. So students are throwing in more applications to colleges that are top ranked, which is driving their application rate even down or the acceptance rate down more. So I'm going to talk about something called institutional priorities, which every business has institutional priorities. These are just the, this is the verbiage that a lot of colleges use. So institutional priorities at a college are the things that are happening behind the scenes that your student likely has little influence on in terms of the outcome of their application. So institutional priorities are the variables that can play a large role in whether or not a student is admitted that, like I said, we can't always predict or know if your student has any control over some of these variables, which we'll get into. So the more selective the college, the more institutional priorities will play a role. So we hear over and over again as college consultants from admissions counselors that most of these highly selective schools where students are piling in the applications, they can fill their classes multiple times over. If you look at this statistic that's at the end of that first bullet point with the number of just public high schools in the U.S., that's 24,000 valedictorians and also 24,000 salutatorians. And if we're mathing, that's 48,000 top two students from every high school in the country. Collectively, those top colleges, we say top just meaning like the most selective, they don't have that many spots even added together to give. So you can see why, you know, the, this... Um, the admit rates are going further and further down. So institutional priorities are often set at the leadership level of an institution. So it can come from as high up as the president to the board of trustees. And as I said, they play a role. And a lot of times they might not have anything to do with what your students' strengths on their application show. So sometimes this is the priorities will drive how a college wants to make their incoming class, how they want that class to look, what they want it to look like. So I put a couple examples here, like some institutions are really committed to first generation students. First generation means students whose parents did not attend college. So if that's an institutional priority, a student who is a first generation student may be admitted over a student who's equally as qualified, but is not first gen. Similarly, things like I, I use tuba players as an example, but you could extrapolate that to literally any um, hyper specific niche. If the college has an orchestra and their first chair bassoon just graduated and they need to fill a bassoon spot, that's how like specific and in the weeds these institutional priorities can become. Let's go to the next slide, Jamie. Thank you. <laughs> 
So this iceberg really tells it all. And if we were sailing on the Titanic, we would see these top things, but we wouldn't see all those things that are happening under the surface. So students are able to influence, to an extent, their odds of admission with great GPA, likely test scores, strong essays, and their extracurriculars. I'm just talking about the stuff students have power over, not letters of rec or any of that. So these are the things students have major influence on. All these institutional priorities we're about to go through are the stuff happening behind the scenes. So if you're the parent or guardian of an amazing kiddo who has all of these things on the top of the surface of the water, please know that whatever their outcomes are in their application process, please know that there's a really good chance it has absolutely nothing to do with how amazing they are and a lot to do with the stuff happening below the surface. Next. All right. So I mentioned earlier, a lot of times directives can come down from board of trustees, presidents. Sometimes it's the mission statement of the school. Um, I think about sometimes like maybe schools with uh, religious affiliations. There might be some kind of, you know, baked in something in the mission statement that dictates how they have to admit students. Academic departments, uh, we hear this a lot from admission reps. And I learned about a lot of these institutional priorities at a talk that was given by the Dean of Students at Harvard, um, as well as I believe it was the uh, Director of Admissions at UVA. So those two were talking about these priorities. And the, they said, you know, as much as they might be known for their um, physics program, they can't just have all math and physics students. They have to admit students that are on the counterpoint of that spectrum. They have to have the humanities. They have to have the performing arts too. Sometimes if a university is introducing a new major, that might become a priority for the school. And so if a student is applying to a major that's already very popular and has a lot of applicants applying to it, computer science, engineering, to name a few, um, but then you have another student who's as qualified or maybe less so who's applying to that newer major or department, they might get in because of that institutional priority new buildings. When there's a new department, a new building, they got to fill it and they got to fill it with people. Gender balance. Um, we, a lot of co-ed institutions want to make sure that they're keeping a balance between the number of female and male students on campus. And we all know about athletics and how that can be an undercurrent that drives certain admissions. Um, that, you know, different teams have different priorities of what athletes they need. I worked at, as I said, a school where um, we kept data over the years on, just as we do at Estrella, of, you know, admit admits for highly selective institutions, GPA, test scores of the students who were admitted. And there were always outliers where maybe they had lower GPAs than the perfect 4.0 ones that were accepted. And a lot of times those students had a hook, um, that's what we call it, which is you know, maybe they were a recruited athlete. Maybe they were a math Olympiad. So these added things that can sometimes earn a student's acceptance when maybe their numbers don't quite meet what you would think would be the accepted averages. Let's go to the next one. Developmental needs. Um, so I've talked with a lot of the families that I work with about this. Um, it's, it's sometimes a hard one to digest, but as Jamie said, colleges are businesses and they have to admit families, students from families who can pay the full amount to offset um, the need to, you know, admit students who maybe wouldn't otherwise have access. So that's what we call a developmental need, like they need to have a revenue inflow. A lot of schools have moved toward international students as well to diversify campus. Um, you know, here, a lot of admissions reps tell us they don't have set quotas, but when it comes to international students, a lot of times there are um, set quotas for those schools because of maybe goals to diversify or developmental needs because international students can't qualify for federal aid. 
um, through the FAFSA always. So you have this uh, developmental need priority being met with international students. Geographical considerations. An institution may have a desire to start pulling more students from the Midwest if it's a school on the West Coast or from the West Coast to the East Coast and vice versa. So that year, your student might be in contention up you know, next to applicants from Minnesota. And if the school doesn't get a lot of applicants from Minnesota, but they get a ton from Ohio, that could be the deal breaker. These are the things we don't get to know, no matter how amazing a student is. Intellectual diversity. I talked a little bit about this with the departments. Um, if it's a, you know, broad strokes, broad based learning liberal arts institution, we can't have a lopsided, you know, math and science student body or a lopsided humanities student body. And then test scores, which in the world of test optional seems like, oh, we don't need to worry about those. But in fact, strong test scores can be another thing that's helping a student. And colleges, part of how, whether we like it or not, part of how rankings are assigned, one of the variables has to do with the test scores that students are you know, submitting and how high they are. So colleges are trying to keep those numbers up as well. Next one. And even though more and more schools are, selective schools are moving away from trying to admit more legacy students, this is still something that can influence the odds of admissions at many selective schools. If a, if a parent or depending on how the school defines legacy, so some schools say grandparents, um, or sibling, but if a parent, grandparent, whatever the legacy definition is, and that will sometimes earn a student a spot, um, and then the donations piece that comes with it to meet those developmental needs. And then um, community. So the surrounding communities that these schools are based in, whatever school we're talking about, there's a town probably in the area. And a lot of times, like I worked in Granville and there was Denison right there. We had a great relationship with them because some of our students took courses there. So that doesn't necessarily mean we don't get to know if our students had an extra advantage in applying to Denison from Granville High School, but there was a community relationship with the high school and the institution. So a lot of times colleges will try to make good on having a certain percentage of students from that surrounding region to keep those relationship, community relationship ties strong. Jamie's gonna talk more about this later, but demonstrated interest, this is a variable that a student can have some influence over. This is connected to that idea of protecting yield. So those sophisticated algorithms run over and over again have shown that students who demonstrate interest have a higher likelihood of enrolling than those who don't. Now, this is only at schools that track it um, and your consultant can help you figure out if you're working with one of us, like they can help you figure out if a school tracks demonstrated interest. If you're, if you're DIYing your uh, college search process, the common data set is where you can find whether or not a school tracks demonstrated interest. And it's denoted as level of applicant interest on the common data set. So again, this is why it's important to colleges to know if students are engaging with them because they wanna protect their yield. And then I mentioned before the idea of developmental um, goals and families that can pay in full, but that also comes um, into play when we're talking about distributing need-based aid from the institution. Most of these highly selective schools that we talk about have been around for at least a good century, if not longer, and they have some pretty deep pockets and large endowments. But in order to make sure those pockets stay deep and the endowments stay large, they have to be mindful of how much institutional aid certain families will need. And if it's a school that is really focused on that priority of protecting their endowments, this could influence whether a student gets in or not, because if they need more aid or less aid, could make or break a decision. 
And then of course, diversity in all of its forms, whatever the goals of the institution are for diversity, whether that's socioeconomic, racial, ethnic, um, sexuality, there could be a lot of different kinds, geography, that they're trying to meet as a priority. Okay, let's move to our next one. Yep, Jamie's going to tell you all about secret sauce. All about the secret sauce. So what is the secret that is going to get you in? What Do we hold some kind of special secret we're going to be able to give you? Sadly, the answer is no. But we will go through some tips and strategies to help you maximize your application and try to address as many of these, um, you know, in institutional priorities, things that we're looking at for your benefit. So the first is activities and involvement. Depth and passion is much more important than number of activities. You do not need to be involved in 30 different activities you know, two sports and 10 clubs and music and art, they would rather see that you have a few things that you do really well and you do really passionately and that you do in several different ways. Like maybe your volunteer work matches up with a sport that you play, um, or maybe your academic interests are being followed by research that you're also following. So go more into depth and passion than number of activities. They want to see also that you're making a substantive contribution to your school or community. So you are not just doing activities for yourself to build your resume, to, you know, make yourself look good. But how are you impacting other people? Are you doing something that benefits your school? Are you doing something that benefits people in your community? Um, I had a student once in the past who um, volunteered taking photos at the animal shelter and putting an Instagram account together to display the animals that are currently available for adoption. She's taking one of her passions, but actually making a difference in the community with that. And also demonstrate your values. So you want the activities and the things that you're involved in to really reflect who you are. When you apply to college, you're trying to show who you are as a person and it's it they everything you do comes together to to show that. So you want things that reflect what you believe in, what you're interested in, and what you really love. Also keep in mind, you are not limited to official organized activities. Sometimes people get kind of stuck in this activity thought of, oh, I have to do these clubs that are available at school, or I have to do sports. Um, there's all kinds of things you can do. So we threw a few examples on there. Um, scuba diving certification. That's a big process. You can do if you that's something you do. You can count that as an activity. If you make jewelry and sell it on Etsy, that counts as an activity. If you write music, um, I mentioned, you know, a former student who ran an Instagram account for the dog shelter, like anything like that is also counted as activities. So feel free to think outside the box when you're trying to figure out what kind of activities would best reflect you. The next one is testing. If you are submitting and test optional, we could run and hold a different webinar on test optional. So we're not going to get super into the weeds on that right now. But if you are submitting your test scores, they should be for a highly selective school, likely near perfect or perfect. Just as Amber said, if you do the math on the top two students in the entire country, there's 48,000 potential top two students in the country applying to college most of them are gonna have very high test scores. So if you decide to submit, and if you're working with a consultant, we can help you decide whether you should submit or not. Um, if you are doing this on your own, you can look at their average admitted test scores um, and, and try to make a decision based on that as well. If you submit AP test scores, I'm yes. interrupting real quick just to say, because of course we did this job, like you can also talk to your counselor. They can help you access the information too, um, to see, you know, what the average admitted is or the middle 50%. Sorry. Yes. No, you're good. That's, you're counselor. exactly right on that. Yes. Yeah, school counselors can always help you do that as well. 
Um, if you're submitting AP's test scores, fours and fives with an emphasis on the areas of designated interest. So for example, in a five on the AP Calc test, if you're planning on engineering, is really good for your application. If you got a five on AP psychology, that's a great score. Doesn't really matter as far as engineering goes. So it's not really going to benefit your application. I would say, I would still say go ahead and submit it, but it's not really going to benefit your application like the ones that match your designated interest would. And if you're in an IB program, your teacher from junior year can provide projected scores. I know you don't take your exams until after your application process will be already finished, but you can get projected scores as well. And we have a star there on test prep because. We want to emphasize that you should still be prepping for your test, even with test optional out there on the table. Would, I, I once heard it described like sort of like a baseball game. If you play baseball, would you go to a baseball game having never practiced? Probably not. Okay. So why would you go into a test not ever having prepped for it? You probably wouldn't go into a test at school without having studied for it. Why are you going into college admissions tests? never having prepped for it. So definitely take advantage of test prep. Test optional is out there and is an option, but you don't want to just think, oh, the tests don't matter. I'm not even gonna worry about it. If you can get a good test score, it will help you. So do the test prep, try to get the best score that you can. And then once you have your scores on the table, make the decision about whether you want to use them or not. The next one we have a star on as well. Research and internship is something that can really make you stand out from other applications. Um, couple things that research shows, and I have we have research and internship both on here because research tends to be more in the STEM fields. Internships tend to be more like humanities business stu type students. Um, so either or, depending on where your interests lie, but they they kind of fall under that same area. So it can show that intellectual curiosity. Remember, Amber was talking about how they're looking for a variety of intellectual interests. This shows that you are not only interested in an area, but you've actually kind of gone beyond just the normal school learning of it and researched and done more on your own with it. It also benefits you in that it helps you explore your career interests and find a good fit. If you delve into research and you decide that it's actually not what you wanna do, that's actually beneficial as well to help you figure out what your interests are and where you wanna go. Um, having relevant experience shows your interest and passions in the field, in your application. So it kind of goes back to demonstrating that intellectual curiosity. And it also can give you substantial information for your Why Us essay. Most colleges have, especially the highly selective schools, have a Why Us essay. And the specific topic can vary. It could be why this college, it could be why your major, um, or why this specific program. But somehow you usually have to show why you specifically are interested in them over another place or another field. Um, so that research and internship opportunity can give you some great information to really demonstrate that you have looked into this and this is what you want to do. So how do you find opportunities? There's all kinds of different ways you can do it. There are a lot of summer programs out there for you. Um, at colleges, you can look at local colleges if you want. Um, if you would be interested in spending a couple weeks, you know, at a college anywhere else, you can look into their summer programs. Um, there are fee-based research opportunities. Talk to family and friends. Is there somebody that you know that is working in a field that you're interested in? Maybe they can let you come in and shadow. Maybe they actually have an opportunity where they could let you be an intern for a little while. Um, depending on the fields you're interested in. You talk to people at museums. They often have student worker positions or student interns. Um, hospitals often have both summer programs. I know that, for example, in Columbus, Children's Hospital has a lot of summer programs for students where they can do research. They also have volunteer opportunities throughout the year where you can work with um, different areas depending on your interests doctors or dentist's office, and local businesses that are in the field you're interested in. So you may need to go out there and do a little bit of networking, talk to people, tell them what you're interested in, and opportunities are available. 
So we're going to go into a few strategies. Those were tips, just kind of general, you know, tips of things you can do. These are actually strategies for your applications themselves. So the first is before you begin anything, before you begin your application or your essay, or even talking to people about letters of recommendation, just reflect for a minute. What about you do you want to showcase in your total application package? Who are you? What are the most important aspects of you? What are your values? What are your qualities? Think about that first, because then you're going to want to piece everything together to show that. So as you are both writing your application and then reviewing it before you submit it, you want to think about a few different things. Are you presenting yourself in a thematically cohesive manner? So as I talked about earlier, when I was talking about activities and involvement, they're looking for depth and they're looking for passion. They don't want a random assortment of things that you've done. Okay, so is there a theme between your activities, your letters of recommendation, your academics? Does that all seem to make sense and be cohesive? Have you used all parts of your application to connect the dots of your life stories? So, and that includes letters of recommendation. So maybe, um, you know, you have three or four things that you're trying to showcase and you have them in your activities and your transcript is reflecting a lot of your academic interests and you in research. Do your letters of recommendation also reflect those same things? Most teachers and counselors have, um, like a brag sheet or some sort of information that they'll have you fill out for your letters. If not, you can always just ask if you can sit down and talk with them when you're asking them for the letter and just say, these are the things I'm conveying in my application. I would love it if you could highlight, you know, this and this that I've done and show them those things. And that's a very important piece of your application. Um, do you seek new challenges? So, are you looking for new things? And that goes back to, for example, potentially research. Do you just settle for, well, I've done these classes and they sound interesting. And so I think I'll major in that. Or did you actually seek out some challenges to learn more or to go deeper into that subject? Um, and that also sort of ties into your senior year schedule. Did you choose to push yourself or did you choose an easy schedule? So even though when you submit applications, your senior year grades are not usually available. They can see your schedule and they wanna make sure that it is just as difficult or more so than your preceding years. And then the last question, what will you do when you don't have to do anything? That sounds like an odd question, but colleges want students who are going to be active in community life. They don't want you to just go to class and then come back to your dorm room and never do anything else, just study and that's it. They want to, an active person on campus. They want you involved in clubs. They want you to may really make a contribution to the community. And so your application can reflect what you are gonna be able to bring to that college. The second strategy is demonstrated interest. So Amber mentioned that in the um, institutional priorities slide. As she said, some colleges track it, not all. So the first thing you want to know is do the colleges track it? Um, it is in the common data set in section C7. Um, if you're digging around in the common data set for a college, you can just Google, like if you're looking for Yale's common data set, you can Google Yale's common data set. It'll usually pop up. Um, and then it's every, the reason it's common is every college displays their information in the same format. So you can go to section C7 and you will see demonstrated not, interest. Not every college, that's the thing. It's oh an, no. Yeah, uh, regrettable, I wish they did. It's an optional um, um, voluntarily contribute their data to. So if a school doesn't have a common data set, they have opted not to showcase their data for yes. whatever then you will not see it. But if, if they do have it, it will be in C7. Um, but what demonstrated interest is, is they want to know that you're genuinely interested in attending. And that goes back to that yield protection that we talked about and that formula of trying to decide how many students they admit are likely to actually come. The Common App makes it really easy to just throw an extra college on there. You know, some students are like, well, let me just see if I can get in here. I've never visited. 
their application fee is not that high. I'm just going to add it on there. That's not what they're looking for. And they, if you have never interacted with them and they track demonstrated interest, that's a likely potential opportunity to get hit with that yield protection of they think you're not going to come. You've never even really interacted with them. So if they do track demonstrated interest for the schools that you're really interested in attending, make a specific effort to interact with them. Several different ways you can do that. Do a visit. If they offer interviews, even if they're optional, take advantage of that. Interviews are as much of an opportunity for you to learn more about the school as it is for them to learn about you. Um, and it also shows that you truly are interested in it. Um, if, they're, if their rep comes to your high school and you're able to miss class to meet with them, go ahead and meet with them. Um, I'm going to say this one with a caution, but send your admissions rep an email if you have questions. My caution on that is make sure you have carefully thought about your question. If it's something easily found on the website, don't necessarily do that. Um, they, they will see right through that. But if you, you know, want to know more about something specific, feel free to reach out to them and ask that. Um, and then another minor one that I always tell students is I know you are getting a ton of emails from colleges, but if there's a school you're interested in, open the email and click on things. Um, and read stuff because they actually can track that and do track that. They'll see what you open, what you spent on it, what you clicked on. Um, so if there's schools you're for sure interested in, spend some time looking at the things they send. The third strategy is supplemental materials. So your application has, you know, basic pieces that they're going to get from everybody, that common app, letters of recommendation, you know, whatever they require specifically. But some colleges also allow additional materials that can demonstrate your talents and, and interests. So this may not apply to everybody. Don't just send extra things just to send them. But if they accept things and this would apply to you, I would heavily suggest potentially sending it. Um, if you are a really accomplished musician, even if you're not planning to major in music, some schools will take music supplements where you can submit recordings. Um, or upload recordings to your application. In a similar vein, there's art supplements where you can submit portfolios or photos of your work. Often you're still allowed to do that even if you're not planning to major in art. Um, if you have a writing portfolio, if you do a lot of, of writing either you know, as part of a school activity or outside of school, you can submit some of that work. If you have participated in research and you have anything published, you can submit an abstract sometimes. A copy of your resume, the common app activities list and honors only it allows you to submit 10 activities and five honors. Um, there are, you know, strategies that either your school counselor or your consultant can work with you to help maximize how to use that space. But if a school will allow you to, su to submit a resume and you have more activities, submit the resume as well. That can be very helpful. Um, we have a caution sign next to supplemental letters of recommendation because this has a caveat to it. Don't just submit extra teacher letters of recommendation. They're going to say similar things to the teachers you already submitted under the regular requirements. Supplemental would be somebody who's going to be able to show you in a different light. So, for example, if you did work on research with a professor at a college, that professor is it's going to have a different perspective on you. Um, if you have done, you know, substantial work um, in an internship with a business, you know, the person that you've worked with there might have something different to say. So don't necessarily just submit extra letters just to submit them. But if you have done work somewhere that you think is not going to be reflected by your teacher letters of recommendation and the college accepts supplementals, feel free to submit that as a supplemental. And then also, sometimes you can submit a link to an online presence. So if you have you know, a school newspaper that's published online, or if you run a podcast, or you have a YouTube channel, um, you can submit a link to that for them to take a look at it if you'd like them to. So this varies college by college on who takes it and what they'll take. But check their admissions website for details on what they accept and how to submit it. Some will give you access to um, upload things once they reviewed your initial app or once they've accepted your initial application and you have access to your portal. Some will allow you to submit it 
you know, with your application. So just check with each school and see how to do it and what they would take. Ah, sorry. It's okay. We gotta now back. I can't go backwards. There we go. Hey. Okay. So I'm going to wrap up with the last strategy here, and then we'll talk a little bit about reassurance and reality, and we'll move into balance list and questions. And you're, you're on the backside just a little bit longer. So at highly selective schools, um, which is every thing we've talked about in this whole presentation is we're referring to highly selective schools, which I should say is, you know, we, t we covered this in part one, but schools whose acceptance rates tend to be around 25, 30% or lower. And then we have like the Uber, Uber selective where you're in like single digits. So these highly selective schools often will have multiple application plans that students can pick which ones they're applying under. They don't apply at all of them. They pick one. So the EDs, the front two there under that bullet point, those are the commitment binding ones. These are the ones where if I apply under this, I'm for sure coming. These are the delightful yield protection ones that colleges tend to really enjoy. Regular decision is the final deadline. Like that is the cutoff after this. There's no more windows to apply. Uh, restrictive early action and early action. So I'm going to cover both of these briefly. Early action is apply early, find out early, non-binding. Restrictive early action, you only see it pop up a handful of times. Certain schools have it. Off the top of my head, I know Princeton, Yale. Um, there's a couple other ones that I'm blanking on. But restrictive early action is when you apply early to that school and you do find out earlier but you cannot apply to any other, and the terms are different at every school, but usually you cannot apply under an early plan to any other private institution um, in an early plan, whether that's early decision or early action. So it's non-binding, yay, but it eliminates the option to apply early decision anywhere else. So you'll want to, if you're looking at a school and it's your top choice and you're considering restrictive early action, really make sure you've read the fine print on the school's website. I have a couple students who are applying under a restrictive early action plan, but they have some public institutions on their list. We're in Ohio, they have Ohio State on their list, maybe University of Michigan. These are public institutions. So they can apply to their early action plans. They just can't apply early action to private institutions. So if you are considering an early decision program, you see why, or application plan, you see the caution sign here because it is binding. It's a commitment. You're saying to the school, if I apply and I'm admitted, I will be there. So if you're going to contemplate, if you're contemplating using an early decision application plan, you really want to do some strategizing. You want to have your facts and your figures in front of you. So we're going to talk about where to locate these. What's But the things you're looking at, facts and figure-wise, are the acceptance rate for students who apply early decision. Is it much higher, just a little higher, not higher at all, than students who apply under regular decision? And how much of that incoming freshman class are they filling through early decision? I shared with a family today that a school might um, have a maybe 5% admit rate, but when you dig into the data, the early decision admit rate might be closer to 20%. So there's the acceptance rate and come to find that school fills half of their incoming class with early decision students. So now there's only half as many seats left if a student is applying regular decision. And if they're not maybe as strong of an applicant, they could be very much up against really strong applicants in that regular decision pool. The other thing I tell students who are considering um, early decision one, do you have another, do you have a second top choice? Is there another school that you're pretty like in love with, but isn't quite as high on your list as a school you're thinking of early decision one at? An early decision two plan comes later in the application cycle, usually in January, and usually well after a student has found out if they've been admitted early decision one anywhere. 
I've also had a handful of students who I call late bloomers, where they find their top choice school later in the process and they've missed the early decision one window. And so they apply early decision two there. So we've talked about the common data set a lot. If you're looking for these numbers and you want to find these statistics, it's in the common data set for a school in section C21 if a school contributes to the common data set. Let's go to our next one here and you'll see um, a picture here of that section and what it looks like. They don't do the math for you. You have to find the early decision C21 and you have to look at the number of applications received and how many students were admitted. Then you have to do some algebra and some division and you figure out what the percentage acceptance rate was at that institution. Let's go to our next one. So we uh, refer to these charts frequently. This is a um, company, Big J Consulting. They put together some really awesome resources that show in a visual way exactly what I was just talking about. So if you're not wanting to math through the common data set, you can go to this website that we have here and you can see a sample here of what their data looks like when it's compiled. So you're gonna notice across the top, we have five columns. Column one just tells you what additional plans they have outside of early decision one. Second column shows what that acceptance rate is. So Brown largely uh, publishes a somewhere around a 4% on average admit rate. But if we disaggregate that data, and we notice that the early decision admit rate is actually 14.6%. Now, that's still super low. So don't like think, woohoo, I'm getting in. No, no, no. Still really low, but not nearly as low as a 4%. And then look at this final column. You're going to see how much that freshman class is filled at Brown through early decision. So if you're looking at a school like Bryant, Bryn Mawr, and you see these are like super tiny slivers, usually that means they're not contributing to the common data set. And if they are, for whatever reason, the numbers weren't enough to even make a graphic, uh, which tells you that they probably don't lean too heavily on early decision. But it's good to know if you have some of these schools on your list, this can help you strategize what if early decision makes sense for your student or for you. Check out our next one. So we're gonna move into talking about reassurance and reality now. And what this information is showing, this visual, you're gonna see two, you see two graphs. On the left side is public colleges. On the right side, we see private colleges. This is showing in the column that is in the in the column where you see zero to 10 all the way down to 91 to 100. That is the acceptance rate. So the number of public colleges that have an acceptance rate 10% or lower. And then if we keep going down, so now let's draw your attention to 31 to 40. Notice the volume of applications that are being submitted to public institutions that admit at a rate of 40% or lower you're seeing how many students are piling in, applying to these institutions that have more selective rates. It's that self-fulfilling prophecy that Jamie talked about where so many students are submitting applications to these few schools that it is driving the admit rates down. This data is from the um, State of College Admissions report that comes out every year from the National Association of College Admissions Counseling. So this is, based only on the universities and colleges that responded to the request for data and information. It's not necessarily every institution in the country, but it's a pretty good sample size. And then let's look at that second graph, number of private institutions by acceptance rates. So again, 30% or lower. Look at how many students are piling in applications to schools admitting 30% or fewer of their applicants. And then we have all these other schools out here that are being neglected, maybe we could say, because they're not maybe in the US News and World Report, or maybe the name isn't as popular on a national level, perhaps regionally, but not nationally. So it's important to have this perspective 
to understand why your counselor or your consultant is urging you to have a balanced list because the volume of applications is so large at just those few institutions that are under that 30% or 40% admit rate. So you want to spread the love to some of those other schools because the odds of being admitted are probably pretty darn great. And then you have an option there for you. So let's look at this information on the flip side. So again, coming from that same state of college admissions report, for the past 20 years, if we take all the colleges, four-year colleges and universities across the country and we average out the acceptance rate, it's actually a 73% acceptance rate from the fall of 2021. And if we look back over 20 years, it's not dropped below 63%. So, and then you can see the other two pie charts there are showcasing the public college acceptance rate and private college acceptance rate nationwide. So if this is the average, you're seeing how few schools there are that are over here on the tippy tippy top of super selective. Do not discount the schools that have a higher admit rate, it is not necessarily a referendum on the quality of education. Rather, it may just be that it's a hidden gem and there may be some significant merit aid there for you. There will be options for um, honors colleges, things like that that can help with maybe some of the more like scholarly pursuits. Make sure you have that balanced list. So in that spirit, we want you to have a balanced list. So we don't want so many schools that are at the tippy top. If our data has taught nothing <laughs> throughout this, it's that it's really difficult to predict the odds of admission. Everybody applying to those super selective schools is probably pretty competitive. So if the schools on your list are only at the tippy top, then you may be in a position where you don't have as many or any options. So we want that balance. We want schools that are hitting the likely, the target, and the reach range. So how we look at that is the statistics of the middle 50% of admitted students. What is the average GPA, if the college reports it, but also test scores? What are the admitted 50% statistics? Are the admitted students scoring an ACT score between 28 and 32? And maybe you're sitting squarely at a 30. You're right there in the middle 50%. You have a lot of the other criteria that school traditionally looks for. That might be a target school for you. So we want some of those on your list to balance out the schools that have those lower than 15 to 20% admit rates, which we call wild card or lottery schools because getting the odds of being admitted are jokingly, but not jokingly, maybe akin to winning the lottery. So we want students to have that balanced out. We want at least two to three likely and two to three target. And here's the rub, schools that you would be happy to attend, not schools that you would consider yourself settling for. No, no, no. We want you to love those schools too and be happy going there. Plus, the more, the higher you are above the middle 50% statistics, the higher the likelihood of you getting some pretty good scholarships at those schools. So we're going to move into the Q&A portion. Um, so you can, yeah, this, oh, I should mention here, you can see our contact information if you should want it. Um, so we're going to do about 15 minutes of questions. We know that this was a lot of information and it took a lot of time to cover it. We wanted to be thorough with you. So if you want to jump off, no harm, no foul. No harm done, no offense taken. You just go right about your night. Um, but if you want to have an opportunity to ask questions, we see that there's some questions um, possibly in the Q&A. Oh, nope, it's Allison. Thanks, Allison. Um, oh, she mentioned Notre Dame is a restrictive early action school. Yes, that's the one I was trying to think of, but I couldn't think of. All right, let's see. So go ahead if you want to put your question in the Q&A or if you want to unmute. And actually, I don't know if I, you guys can unmute. I don't know if I have boss controls over that. There we go. All right. No cues in the Q&A. We know it's a lot of information. We do appreciate you being here. Um, because you registered, you'll get a copy of this recording. 
Oop, we got a Q. Great question. Jamie, you want to read the question and take the question? Yes. Can you apply early decision two to a college you have already applied regular decision? So I am going to answer this and I may pull Amber in for additional information. But if you have already submitted your application, I believe if they have not evaluated it yet and sent you a decision, you could contact them and ask to switch it to early decision too. It may depend on where it's at in the in the review process, whether they can switch it or not, but you can always contact them and ask. If you haven't submitted it yet, then yes, you can definitely just switch it to early decision too before admitting or before submitting it. Yep. Ooh, here's a nice pro tip for um, all of our seniors or parents of seniors or parents of future seniors on the call. If your student does apply early decision and especially early decision one and early decision two, senior grades, first quarter grades are often requested from the institution to which your student applied early decision one to. So we say often, counselors say often, senior grades matter. But early decision applicants, early decision one applicants, those first quarter senior grades are 99% of the time requested from you to be uploaded into your applicant portal as part of the application review process. And they can make a big difference if a school's on the fence about admitting a student. Similarly, for early decision two, your semester grades are going to be included in that part of their review. So... <laughs> Plan accordingly, seniors. You're welcome. Great question. Okay. Ooh. Okay. Jamie, you want to read it? Yeah. Could you give us your opinion of the impact of the recent Supreme Court decision might have on this upcoming cycle? That is a great question. Um. Honestly, I think some of it's an unknown. There's a lot of discussion out there. Um, there is a lot of information. So just to give a little bit of background, um, the Supreme Court has determined that colleges cannot consider race as in race just indicated on the application as part of the admissions decision. However, they can consider the impact that a student's experiences have had on that student's life, academics, things like that. So what I've started to see is a lot of colleges are adding supplemental questions if they didn't already have them, um, supplemental essays asking a student to describe their experiences, to describe um, you know, the impact of you know, their lived experiences. Um, and it's essentially asking how have aspects of either your race, your culture, things like that impacted your life. So Amber, do you have anything you want to add to that? No, that's perfect. I think, um, I mean, that's that's the context. So we're seeing the, the question being asked in a, I guess, euphemism way. And students can decide how they want to convey. For some students, that's a really big part of their identity. Um, my opinion, since it's the opinion of the impact, I think I land where Jamie is. It's kind of an unknown. Um, just like when we started into COVID and things were unknown, we have a lot better sense once we've been through a cycle or two and we have some, some data um, to, to weigh in. I don't think colleges are suddenly going to decommit from a desire to have a diverse student body and diverse in whatever way, you know, racial diversity is, is one aspect, but I don't think colleges are certainly going to be uninterested in that. It's going to be more a matter of how they find that information. Thanks for asking. Yep. Um, the next one, have you seen stories or statistics about more students applying to schools when they are not likely candidates driving down the acceptance numbers? Yes, I think test optional has contributed to this, um, it, along with the ease of the Common App. Um, I think the Common App was already sort of trending that direction before test optional really came into the picture, and that it's you do have to write some supplementals and things like that, especially for the highly selective schools, but it's not a ton of extra work to add extra schools to 
your application. You already have the base of it done. And so as the Common App was growing, I think it was it was you were starting to see more and more applicants in that way because they're like, well, I'll just add this one in to see if I can get into the school. And then you throw test optional on top of that. That's where you're really, I think, starting to see kids who may not have thrown in applications previously submitting them now. Um, I do think that there's also a number of qualified applicants submitting. And so I, I wouldn't necessarily say that all of those numbers are students who are not likely to get in. I, it's still a fairly small percentage of, I, I think the kids who are not likely candidates are still a pretty small percentage of the total number of applicants, but it, it probably has gone up. Sure. And then when you add in, like Jamie said, the ease of the application, if I'm a super competitive, uber competitive applicant, it might not be that much work for me to now, instead of submitting just 10 applications, I'm going to submit 20 and see where the chips fall. So that also drives down numbers. It's the same people <laughs> applying everywhere that is part of the issue. Great question. Yep. I would also echo, this actually goes back to the original, the first webinar that we had, if you were on that, but one of the questions there was, should you submit more more applications to just up your chances of getting in somewhere? And the answer there was definitely not. So I'm going to echo that because it kind of goes along with that question too. You don't need to apply to all the Ivy League schools to up your chances of getting into one. It doesn't It doesn't work that way. No, in fact, there was a really interesting thread that went around our um, professional association listserv, I think it was in the winter, and it was a thought exercise, and like we had statisticians weighing in on that very point. If you spread, if you spread out the, you know, number of darts you're throwing at the dartboard, might you hit the bullseye? Statistics and probability would suggest yes, but any statistician... <laughs> who weighed in on it said exactly what I think anyone in our field would say. Um, institutional priorities, qualitative variables, there could be so many things happening behind the scenes that the, the math doesn't work when you have a human element and an institutional element dictating some of the enrollment goals. Good job bringing that full circle, Jamie. <laughs> Well, we are at our time. You have all been wonderful and attentive and have asked really good questions. Thank you for taking time out of your night to be with us. We appreciate it. Um, and we will see you probably maybe hopefully in the future on another webinar. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.